Hey everyone, my name is Phil Province, and I'm going to read you um, at the encouragement of our mutual friend, Ryan. I'm going to read you some uh, poems from my latest collection, A Plan in Case of Mourning. Um, Ryan's request. I'd like to start with the pieces that um, that actually appeared in Sons and Daughters. Um, prior to the publication of the collection. The first one is uh, the proem to the collection. Um, proem being a, an introductory poem. It's called Epigram for the Neanderthals. <clears throat> what woman wants a fireman? A plan in case of mourning. A man with hands like Hoover Dams who makes an easy hundred grand who trades his viper for a van, a man who's frankly boring. That kind of pairs with the other piece that appeared in Sons and Daughters, uh, how it goes. The woman shoves her way deeper into the forest thrusting aside some beech limbs blocking her path. I watch her freckled shoulders and thighs disappear behind a thicket of brambles and picture her shimmying into red heels, mini skirt, and faux mink jacket. Then I discover the back of my head has been resting the entire time against a potato-sized piece of limestone and is buried up to the ears in a thick tuft of moss. With nothing else to do, I light a cigarette and look up. The bare black branches form a net to catch the sky as two blackbirds jostle in the treetops. Crows, it appears, and whether they are playing or fighting is impossible to tell. <clears throat> All I know is what I see. One bird carries a holly twig in its beak, a single scarlet berry, dangling from one end while the other follows several feet behind bouncing along the slender bow where they both landed then gaining on the first crow the second nips at the berry and the pair scuffle their beaks forget the twig amid flapping and cawing and it drops to the forest floor striking my chest berryless Suddenly I realize I am cold. <clears throat> it's actually um, one of these won several smaller individual poem prizes seems to be a general favorite so we'll go with that one next this is Gen Y love poem when I text you platonic kissy face rest assured I do not mean I love you so much as I love the half-hearted ironic gesture rest assured I am still lean-faced as any dust devil, still willing to devour you, still ready to drag you up a long flight of Chicago high-rise steps, club or cocktail in hand, rest assured I still mean I love listening to you, talk of Tartars and Saladin and how Mahmed the second compares favorably with Erdogan. Trust me, my love is still trying to glimpse the titles of others' books around wrought iron chairs and sunny-dried ficuses on any veranda under any tricolor awning in Wicker Park with you. Which is to say, I am still in it for myself to keep you there 
is still the mystery of whether I will stay. <clears throat> now let's do one more from the first part of the collection. Um, it's structured in three parts, so um, kind of follows the Campbellian hero tale schema. Um, and so the first part kind of traces my own little saga um, in, the, in the breakdown of, of, uh, of my relationship with my son's mother. And so the first part is kind of devoted to these quirky, we should call them love poems, but they're about love as it is, I guess, or at least love as I experience it, as opposed to a kind of idealized view of it. And, the, you know, there's a bit of idealization there. Um, but never without some irony. Okay, this is Poet as the Sea um, at the Kursal by South End Pier. How nice would it be to be the sea when you first take a dip in spring, splashing full of watery thoughts, I'd feel you plunge in, then raise my current towards the beach to rinse you in warm tides, the wishing seagulls drifting in in languid long low dives. Of course, what modesty exists between a swimmer and the sea, amidst the sunlight's tickling gleam, I couldn't help myself but stream into your two-piece top and slish along your belly, hips and thighs, until at last I'd splash into your nostrils, mouth and eyes. <clears throat> Let me think here. Something. That hasn't been recorded. You could actually I've done other recordings. Um, one of the pieces um, that's been anthologized. Um, St. Petersburg has many churches. There's a recording on Asian Chow, which is a great journal. If you've. Uh, you've ever had a chance to check it out and um, Inlandia has a recording of the first poem Chicago Tableau so I'm gonna to try to since I have the, the microphone here try to record a few for posterity that don't have sound or video recordings yet this one's the stenographer's union Darko why can't you sleep right now the stenographer's union is inflating the moon just over that hill Soon, the moon will catch fire in the back room of a Halloween novelty shop. The SU is already dissecting Crawford Avenue, brick by brick. The moon is just a jellyfish we all have a spoon in. <clears throat> Darko, your eyes are falling out. The grand stenographer is loading his standard issue pocket protector. Eventually, he will don the wig of a 70-year-old German janitor. Eventually, each of his teeth will become a perfect-scale replica of Nebraska. Then, old Monsignor Le G.S. will look a bit more like you and me. You, who aren't as serious as we might sound. You, with your heart like a toothless rattle. But aren't we the generation of hard luck and broken parts? Don't our iron crosses just float as well as witches? Oh, I, I like this one. This one's chatty. Um, hard to say. <clears throat> the sky is miserable. It was going to have its own little tea party, but no one came. Such a pity, too. The new teapot gave off such a brilliant sheen, and the spoons reflected so flawlessly. But to top it off, it is that time of the month for the sky. It feels like a precisely written note in which each letter has been drawn, exactly the size of a sand flea. So precisely, in fact, that packed in each letter is a tiny box, and in each box 
is an even smaller letter the size of a sea monkey. Yes, let's think of sea monkeys. They are so nice and enter cryptobiosis so civilly that shipping their eggs seems no work at all. What is cryptobiosis? I assume it's like crypto-fascist, but with borax and yeast. We are all so tiny in our own tiny lives that it's hard to say anything. Huh. Yeah. So here we go. <clears throat> Another kind of interesting one, I think. Um, um, I really, really enjoy um, the Twilight Zone, and I have since I was a kid. It was something my dad turned me on to. And so I really enjoy, like, envisioning these dystopian fantasy worlds. Um, and so this one just kind of occurred to me one day. And I was just chit-chatting with some friends on Facebook. And someone dared me to write a poem in on my Facebook wall. And I did it. And it ended up... Um, ended up placing in a contest <laughs> and all I did was I just rattled this thing off it took maybe like 15 20 minutes so um, yeah I, I can be obnoxious right um, but let's uh see how this one goes why the coyote doesn't just order Chinese no money that coyote's a survivalist he converted all his currency into precious metals and Swiss army knives back in 08 the setting is obviously New Jersey. Obviously, the bomb has already dropped. Obviously, the laws of physics no longer apply. The coyote, in fact, is not a coyote, but a man. And all the Acme shit and the Roadrunner himself are just figments of his imagination. Really, his name is Bob. He's the lone survivor of a nuclear war. He whips his body wildly at an imagined bird imagining himself an equally small canine. It's ridiculous, he knows. But what else is there to do? When you are a meter underground, and the last of your kind, you might as well dream big or go home. So he dreams of explosions. He dreams of contraptions. He dreams in Technicolor, deep in his underground bunker. He's about 70 or so, maybe 80 max. His 100,000 sea rations and cans of peas have long since been opened and their contents devoured alone so that their containers litter his safe cave like so many empty bombshells. Two weeks ago, he ate the last tin of Viennese wieners, the very last food left after 40 years. Now, he is starving. Listen. That is the sound of him starving. But in his dreams, he's getting closer. Each dream he thinks of falling off a cliff. He is getting there, and each time it happens, he arises perfect, whole, finally unscathed ready to assemble the cogs, gears, and pulleys that are the next mechanism of tomorrow. <clears throat> I'll just do a couple more and hopefully, well, we'll see, right? I don't think I'm going too fast. I'll do a couple more. A couple ones that I really want to like get into recording, right? Um, great expectations. In 1987, it was hot in Pennsylvania. So hot, they canceled baseball practice, and I had to stay home with my grandmother with nothing to do but watch the ragweed my mother's garden turn yellow. I started walking out to the end of the, our gravel driveway twice a day to check the mailbox and to watch for my grandmother's car. Sometimes I would lie on the hood of her red Chevette and look for elephants and giraffes among the clouds until the searing steel burned the back of my head and neck. Then one day, as I was digging a divot in the front yard, convinced by Bugs Bunny I could dig my way to China, a broad black shadow skimmed the grass blades in front of me. I looked up, and there was the belly of a massive bird, its wings broad as I was tall. It glided towards the cornfield and alighted among the toppled dry stalks, and I saw it there, large, erect, 
brown-black plumage rippling as its muscles settled like a divine protector, a sign from God. So I dashed for our gray-sided trailer, shouted, Grandma, come see, a bald eagle! But when her cotton ball head poked out the doorway, I saw her hip shift, saw her adjust her glasses, and she said, Fool child, that ain't no eagle. That's a vulture. A vulture? Yeah, a vulture. See, it ain't got no white feathers on its head. But it's bald. A bald eagle ain't really bald. Then why do they call it bald? Because they're more foolish than you. Then she slammed the screen door, probably went back to her book or crossword, and I sat staring at that vulture till I felt I'd had enough. I grabbed a crab apple stick from near the dog box, then tromped into the field, swinging at the lying thing till it hissed in my face viciously and whooshed off. All right, folks. Well, I think that I've perhaps overstayed my welcome, but thank you for your time. And again, if that little sample intrigues you, do buy this book. Um, I will tell you that if you go and you buy this book, you have a chance to win $10,000. So for details, you must go to www.aplanningcaseofmourning.com and follow the instructions there. Um, other than that, uh, I'd like to wish you a wonderful night and um, yeah. Later.